thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee, and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Beginneth the 22nd verse of the 32nd chapter of the book of Genesis, where Jacob wrestles with the Lord to obtain a blessing. In those days, Jacob rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jebok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he had prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, which means he striveth with God. For thou hast striven with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, What for is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel which means the face of God. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, unto this day. Because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. Here endeth the lesson. Thank you. 
uh, clear understanding of the Christian faith. Uh, a very vital question, and one on which I hope to see much light shed. You can find details about that uh, in the uh, uh, Sunday booklet, and I believe also there's a number of discounts available, uh, so if uh, the price seems a bit steep to you, uh, check those out. Please stand for the invocation. Gospel, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, one of the terrors we live with in our age is the computer virus. Uh, it's a sort of suggestive term. We talk about these viruses, uh, which infect our computers and disable them, and which we are mostly, most of us, helpless to do anything about, and we need to call in some technical expert to help us and uh, uh, clean our, our computers from the infection of this virus and uh, uh, set it working again. And the image of the computer virus is a very helpful one um, during Lent, uh, because uh, um, in our call out today, for instance, we hear of evil thoughts which assault and hurt the soul. And uh, those evil thoughts could be understood as something analogous to a computer virus, a kind of mental microbe, a uh, spiritual virus which infects our thoughts, our hearts and minds, so that we're not able to think straight. We're not able to think rationally, uh, responsibly, realistically about spiritual reality. And uh, those evil thoughts that infect our souls are indeed nothing else than the wiles and deceits of the devil that our baptism service speaks of. Uh, they, the devil, Jesus says, is a liar and the father of lies, uh, and he is the author of evil thoughts, which prevent us from thinking straight, from seeing clearly, from making good decisions. What, what kind of evil thoughts are, are, are in, in question here? Well, things like lust, or greed, or arrogance, or anger, or despair. These are all uh, evil thoughts which distort our thinking. Uh, it's notorious, of course, that the, you know, the person with anger issues is the last one to notice that he has a problem with anger, right? Uh, when we're inside, when those evil thoughts have infected our mental software, we're not able to think straight about ourselves. Moreover, even when we do sort of perceive, oh, maybe there is a problem with anger, uh, we realize that's something we need help with. Uh, there's only so much we can do on our own efforts. And that, of course, makes perfect sense. Sickness cannot be the cause of health. A diseased mind cannot heal itself. Uh, we need, indeed, healing from outside. Well, that, perhaps, is a way of thinking about uh, uh, what uh, the scripture calls, or the prayer book calls evil thoughts, also what the scripture calls the wiles and deceits of the devil. In early Lent, we have three Sundays where indeed um, liberation, deliverance from the power of devils is indeed very much at issue in the gospel lessons. And it's a way of thinking that's maybe not natural to modern people in the West, uh, though that may not be the true of people in other parts of the world. Uh, but if we think of those very much as these... Uh, uh, evil thoughts, these computer viruses which affect our minds, we start to see how important it is for our spiritual liberty, for our ability to see and act in a spiritually healthy way, that uh, we be set free from these or protected from them. So last Sunday we saw, of course, that Jesus was victorious over the temptations, the evil thoughts that the devil tried to plant in his mind. He gave them no consent of his will, and he was victorious. And by his grace, we may hope to be delivered from those evil thoughts as well. 
And so the question that today's lessons really address is how that grace becomes ours. How is it the grace of Christ by which he triumphed against the devil and his wiles and deceits, his evil thoughts, uh, how that can become ours also? How can that grace become ours? And of course, the answer is simple. It's prayer. Lent is a season, indeed, of spiritual spring training uh, in the disciplines of fasting and prayer and the giving of alms. This Sunday, we take a closer look at the kind of prayer uh, which delivers us from uh, the tyranny of the infection of evil thoughts uh, into something spiritually healthy. And our example, our model uh, for this doctrine of prayer, this teaching about prayer, is indeed given us in the story we've read in the gospel lesson of the woman of Canaan came to Jesus asking for help for her daughter who is grievously vexed in a devil of the devil. Now what's remarkable about this story and makes it difficult for many people is that Jesus is so reluctant to help her. He is cold, uh, he is uninterested, uh, and you know he says these really harsh things to her um, and, and then suddenly at the end he goes from being completely cold and reluctant to being warm-hearted and full of praise and enthusiasm for her. And it, people find it difficult to grasp what's happening here. And, of course, in today's liberal church, you get the people who say things like, well, Jesus was narrow-minded and bigoted. He was subject to ethnic and sexual prejudice and bigotry. And, of course, this woman had to come along and set him straight. And that's, of course, just our own culture speaking there is utterly unperceptive reading of scripture. It, for one thing, it's simply the woman herself, refute, her, her own testimony refutes that, uh, and it doesn't actually account for uh, what actually happens in the story. If we're, and what it conceals from us is what the story is telling us is about the secret of prevailing prayer. The secret of prayer that brings deliverance from the devil and all his wives. So, what does this woman show us? She shows us three things about the prayer that prevails. First, it is the prayer of faith. Secondly, it is prayer that persists in hope. Uh, and third, it is the prayer of humility. So first, it's the prayer of faith. Notice how she addresses Jesus. Son of David. She's using a messianic title. And she, what she asks for is indeed deliverance from the devil. It's evident that she has heard uh, rumors, the good news, of what Jesus has been doing in nearby Galilee. That news which attracted vast crowds and which the Gospels tell us spread like wildfire throughout the region and beyond. Uh, news of someone who not only had power from God uh, to uh, del deliver people from demons, but also a willingness to do so. Jesus had come proclaiming the kingdom of God, declaring the good news, the gospel of God's goodwill toward men, declaring it both in words but also in works of power. And no more potent sign of Christ's mission and of the gospel he's proclaiming than for God to, by the power of God, that he would cast out demons from poor, afflicted human beings. God's kingdom reclaiming the world from Satan's control one person at a time. Clearly she has heard this. Clearly she has believed this. Clearly this, has a, this belief in what she's heard has awakened in her a great hope. And in that hope she prays. If you don't hope, you don't pray. And if you don't believe the gospel, you have nothing to hope for. Prayer begins in hearing the gospel, in responding in faith, and in and acting on the hope that it awakens in you, a hope of deliverance from an evil, a hope of attainment of good things. Uh, hers is the prayer of faith. But it's faith, of course, that is put to a test. Just as Jesus was tested in the wilderness on his faithfulness as son to God, so this woman's faith is put to the test by Jesus. And it's put to the test in a way that we all know about, which is silence, right? We've all had those prayers 
uh, I mean, uh, they actually may be the normal form of much of our praying in which we get no response from God. And it seems that God is not hearing. And, uh, you know, we're foolish if we think somehow that means that God is somehow asleep on the job uh, or, or that he's uh, uh, unwilling to hear us. Uh, it is, of course, a very simple test of faith. Faith is belief in what you can't see and experience directly. Belief on the basis of God's word and testimony. So the immediate question is, are you going to continue believing even when you don't see or experience the results you want directly? If you give up because those results don't appear, well, your faith was not very real. It was insubstantial. Uh, if you actually believe the good news of the gospel, if you've taken your stand on his power and will to save and help, then you're going to keep praying even when God doesn't respond, even when God seems to be ignoring you. And that's precisely what this woman does. She persists. She refuses to be discouraged. She redoubles her efforts. And it is not an easy victory. Uh, Jesus moves from discouraging silence to discour discouraging words. He says when his disciples who basically come to him saying, she's pestering us, give her what she wants and get rid of her. Jesus says, I'm sorry, that's not my mission. I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She is outside uh, my rebel mission. She's a Gentile. In fact, a woman of Canaan, as St. Matthew says. Someone who's outside the covenant. She does not have privileges inside the covenant. And his mission is, first and foremost, Israel. Uh, if you overheard that, you might think, well, in that case, I better go somewhere else. But the woman does not give up. She perseveres. She persists. And even when Jesus says to her, it is not me to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs, even then, she does not give up. So she is like wrestling Jacob, we heard about in the first lesson. Who, will, who says to the angel, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And St. Paul talks about that more than once. He talks about the importance of continuing instant in prayer. A uh, good example of King James English, that where the word has changed its meaning between the 17th century and now. To continue instant in prayer is to be insistent in prayer, persistent in prayer, earnest, urgent, importunate, not taking no for an answer, not walking away in a huff, not walking away in despair, continuing instant in prayer, that's the kind of persistent prayer that doesn't let God go until he bless us. That also is the a sign of the reality of the faith of this woman is that she persists in hope despite discouragement. And that needs to be the case for our prayers as well, if we hope to obtain the blessing. So a prayer of faith, a faith that persists in hope, a prayer also of humility. This is the hardest part of the whole scripture passage for many people. And it's a part where people often uh, just miss what's right there. And so I'm going to try to explain it as clearly as I can and hopefully something I say will uh, turn the lights on for you. So the background here has been signaled by St. Matthew. She's a woman of Canaan. The Canaanites are the archetypal example of the Gentiles who know not God, the godless Gentiles. Gentiles. And the definition of Gentiles uh, in their relation to God is that they are greedy for what God gives, but they don't give God thanks and praise. They simply want to use God to get the worldly blessings they want, but once they use him, they've got no further need for him. And uh, which is to say their posture is one of unbelief. And uh, uh, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, don't throw your pearls before swine, or give what is holy to dogs. The gifts of God, the gifts of 
his blessing are given to faith and to faith alone. They're not given to unbelief. And so his working assumption in Gentile territory, meeting a woman in Canaan, is that we've got another kind of standard Gentile who is going to have that godless greed for, uh, who wants to basically use God to get a material blessing for herself and um, has no interest in what that blessing is supposed to underscore, proclaim, and affirm the coming of the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, and so he says, it's not meat to take the children's bread and to th throw it to the dogs. Now, you could understand if this woman got in a huff and walked away. You could understand if this woman said, you can't talk to me that way. I have rights. That's, in fact, what our culture would encourage us all to say. Somehow you owe me, God. You're under some moral obligation to give me what I want because I want it and I want it now. Uh, our whole inclination in, death, in our sinful nature is precisely to do that, to use God for what we can get from him, and if he won't give it to us, to spurn him, to punish him, uh, because he's let us down. That's not what this woman does. What she does is truly amazing. Even Jesus is amazed, and he's not easily amazed. What does she say? Truth, Lord. You're absolutely right. Uh, there's n I cannot protest anything, the rightness of what you say. Truth, Lord, for indeed, what the dogs eat is not the children's bread, but the crumbs which fall from the table. The crumbs which fall from that astonishing, lavish banquet of grace and mercy which you spread in the gospel for those who believe. And that's the moment which moves Jesus to amazement. That's the moment when his reluctance and his coldness, apparent coldness, turns into warmth and praise. That's the moment when her prayer breaks through. What is it that she said that, uh, you know, breaks through here? You might think that she's saying, you can call me any name you like, you know, or something like that. No, it's not about abasing herself. It's not about accepting gratuitous abuse. No, it's this, that she perceives with great clarity that, in fact, she does not deserve the grace of Christ, the gifts of God, that she does not merit them, that she's not entitled to them, that she has no right to them, and her claim for them is not on that basis of all, but simply, her claim is simply on God's free, unmerited grace. See, the goodwill which Christ has declared in the gospel, the goodwill of God toward men, which he's declared in word and work of power, it's his gracious goodwill that he's proclaimed. Something that we cannot possibly deserve or merit or be entitled to. And when we, receive, when we perceive, by faith, the nature of this goodwill, the nature of its working, that it is indeed and it works indeed by a free and unmerited grace, by, you might say, the spontaneous overflowing of God's infinite goodness, that's the faith which shows that we're not a godless Gentile, that we're not a greedy pagan, that in fact we've been gifted with spiritual vision, that we see and perceive uh, the, the true holiness at work in the gospel, the true holiness of God. It is by grace, through faith, that we are delivered from evil. Not on the basis of works or entitlements or any kind of uh, natural right. Uh, and it is that prayer, the prayer of that faith, which in authentic, deep, profound humility claims nothing for itself and its own deservings, but simply of God's free grace and mercy. That's the prayer that breaks through. That's the prayer that prevails. And it is precisely that kind of praying that our prayer book service excels in. And you might say what moves all the way through uh, the prayers of the prayer book, but especially the prayer of humble access, which actually echoes the very language of the, the woman uh, that Jesus says. And the woman replies, 
uh, crumbs from the table. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy great mercy. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. The whole work of our liturgy is to bring us to that point where we see what the woman of Canaan sees and we will what the woman of Canaan wills. And in that knowing and willing we receive what we seek. Even deliverance from all evil. Put this another way and I'm keeping you a little longer but I want you to grasp this. The woman does not get her way with God she does not impose her will with him, on him. She does not wear him down. She does not pester him until he says anything for a quiet life. She does not impose her will on him, which is, I think, how we often think about prayer. No, she subordinates her will to his. She subordinates her will to his good and perfect will. Even when that will, in justice and holiness, rules against her. She support, su submits herself to God's just judgment. And in so submitting her will to his will, her will is aligned to his will. Her will is, uh, uh, becomes the instrument of his will. And so Jesus can say to her, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. You can have what you want because you want it on the terms in which God is willing to give it. And so prayer is the willing of God's will. At the heart of prayer is thy will be done. At the heart of prayer is the conscious willing of God's gracious good will declared in the gospel by his son Jesus Christ in word and work of power, received by us in faith, apprehended us in faith, and now we will it consciously. And as we consciously will it in prayer, that will comes to fruition in us. That will is accomplished in us. That will is uh, fulfilled in us. We become the instruments by which God's gracious will and purpose comes to pass in the world as well as in ourselves. And of course, if we've grabbed hold of God's good will in this way, this isn't, a, this isn't just an isolated moment. This is our whole life. And so the willing of God's will becomes indeed the whole nature of our lives. And what is the will of God? This is the will of God. Even your sanctification, says St. Paul in the epistle, that you should grow in holiness. That as you have received the apostles, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. You receive the Holy Spirit. That's what's expelled the evil spirit from you. That's the crumb of grace that you sought from the banquet of God's kingdom. The Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our redemption, and by that Holy Spirit, we are called to serve Lord and empowered to serve the Lord in holiness. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. If you've, if you've had trouble grasping hold of what's being taught here in this strange and wonderful story of the woman of Canaan and her prayer to Jesus and the way in which his reluctance turned into warmth, Take some time. Work through it in your mind. Write me an email if you need some clarification, some point to recall, or look at, look at the, the video feed. This is something so important. This is a prevailing prayer. This is what the kind of prayer that mature Christians should be engaged in. This is what Lent is for. It's precisely to, we should exercise ourselves in this kind of prayer. And um, you're here, it's a wonderful thing. This whole hour is an exercise in that understanding and practice of prayer. May it fulfill you, each and every one of you, with blessing. Amen.
Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle hast taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations and to receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word, and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers, that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace and especially to this congregation here present. That with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear. beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to give us grace so to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear with comfortable words our Savior Christ said unto all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that prevail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here also is St. Paul said, This is a true saying, and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Here also is St. John said, If any man sin, we have an advocate of the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. It 
is, let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee. O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel, command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty, with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks, for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, and we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us, 
and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us.
Let's try. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost vouchsafe to feed us who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom, by the merits of his most precious death and passion. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us by your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.